Baptist Church, I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing together, worshiping our King.
Good morning, friends. We're glad that you're here with us this weekend. I've been having debates with some coworkers and friends of mine of when fall really starts. You know how this goes. You know, is it the local coffee shops and when they open up the pumpkin spice drinks? Or is it when college football starts? Or is it kind of according to the calendar? I don't know about you, but I'm ready for fall to begin. And uh, we're glad that you're here this weekend as we somewhat move into that season. I also know this, that uh, it becomes a busy season. Uh, my wife and I have had a number of those conversations where we get out the calendar and we start going over the calendar and asking one another, you know, what are we, we doing this week and what's going on? Uh, we want to welcome you here. If you're new here, thanks for adding this in. Uh, we do believe this, that uh, this is a place where we want to help you discover completeness in Jesus. We think it's great to prioritize being here. So, so thank you. If you're new or if you've been around for a bit, uh, but you've not connected and gotten you know, plugged into some key things that you want to see uh, in your life as you continue to grow, we'd want to invite you to come out into the back lobby, the welcome area, or come and, and chat with a few of us as, and find some ways for you to get connected. A couple announcements. So this is that conversation, right? You get out your calendar, a couple announcements, some things coming up, two of them. Uh, first one is this. It's a new event. It's called Impact Day. Here at Christ Church, we talk quite a bit about our impact partners. In fact, uh, we talk about the proceeds uh, in the cafe going to our impact partners. We'll at times bring them up here on stage and interview them so that you get to know some of the people that we work with in the ministry of the gospel, both here locally and around the world. But on this day, this impact day, you have the opportunity to stand side by side, physically side by side with one of our impact partners here in the area and serve in that ministry. Uh, Neighborhood Lifehouse is a local gospel-centered ministry that is striving to minister to people in their neighborhood. And on this day, we have the opportunity to come and help not only see and hear about their ministry, but also to serve alongside of them as they prepare for a neighborhood party, a potluck that evening. There'll be food, there'll be music, they'll be dancing. And, and you all have the opportunity then, all ages, kids all the way up through senior adult, uh, to get involved, get your hands dirty, and serve one of our ministry partners. We'd love for you to join in in that. And if you are interested or have questions, please email Maggie Shea. Here's calendar item number two. Um, we have, uh, from time to time, uh, had an all-church party, especially in the fall as the weather cools down. Um, I'm hoping for the weather to cool down, but as the weather cools down, um, we have gotten out into the, the uh, parking lot out here and uh, parking lot with camping chairs and games, as well as food trucks or free food in this instance, um, had the opportunity to celebrate this community together. And I love this moment because I can kind of walk around from camping chair circle to camping chair circle and uh, see some of you who attend even different services. So we'd love for you to mark your calendars for this. Again, free food. There'll be fall games. There'll be activities for you as well as just the opportunity to sit around and uh, get to know one another or celebrate life together. All right. That said, one more announcement, and that is this. Every week we get the opportunity to celebrate those who make a decision uh, to follow Christ as a disciple. And if you would, turn your attention to the screen. We get to celebrate one more of those today. All of that said, would you please stand? We're going to pray, and then we're going to continue our time of worship. God, I'm grateful for this family, the, these friends who are here. And God, yet I also know this, that as we come into this place, even on a, a holiday weekend like this, God, we come from different places at times. We, we come sometimes bearing burdens. Uh, God, sometimes we come and we're, we're able to celebrate. We're grateful. Something, something positive is, is happening in our lives. God, I'm grateful that we can stand here side by side that we can celebrate with those who are celebrating and also grieve with those who are grieving. But together that we can proclaim your goodness and your truth, but we can also cry out to you of how much we need you. And so God, however we come in this morning, we know that you are also here, that you also meet us here. And so we pray that as we center our minds and our hearts and our souls and our lives on you this morning, God, that you will help us to abide, both in the good and in the hard. And so, Father, help us to minister to one another, help us to encourage one another, to speak truth to one another, God, to serve one another. Help us to be the, the church, the people that you, that you envision, 
when you call us your children. God, thank you for this, this church and this opportunity to worship. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to sing together, worshiping our God, who's given us everything we need according to the riches of his glory. Look at the flowers and all of the beauty. So why would I worry at all? You're faithful to supply everything I need, everything I need. My father has it, my father has it. Every single time, the Lord will provide. My father has it, my father. 
I know this about myself. I, I need reminders. 
Apparently, everyone else believes this about me as well. It's why everyone is always reminding me of things. The school district and work and other people ask me to download apps to, to remind me of things. And uh, people call me or text me and say, hey, remember, uh, we have those conversations, like I mentioned earlier, where we pull out the calendar and we remind one another of some of the things coming up on our schedule. Uh, I need reminders because, to be honest, sometimes I'm easily distracted uh, not just because of my personality, but also because of all of the activity, all of the tasks, all of the responsibilities. And, and it can be overwhelming. I don't, I don't know if this is true for you or not, but this can be true for me. I remember uh, one time I downloaded a, a game on my phone. I'm not really like a game guy on my phone, but downloaded a game on my phone. It was uh, an airport, and you're supposed to land these airplanes of different sizes coming in at different speeds. And, and you're supposed to you know, kind of create a flight pattern. And then as they took off, you're supposed to help create a flight pattern so they're not crashing into each other. But that game was so stressful, I deleted it within like two days. It was terrible. And I remember like a few weeks later, my life felt that way. I couldn't delete, delete and I was like, what? Like, I mean, here's this, here's this moment where I experienced just the tension of feeling like I need to let all these tasks and responsibilities land and I need to, you know, get some things to take off and... It just feels like I'm crashing everything. I remember just like that tension of that moment. What Paul says in Philippians where he, I mean, he's a busy guy too. He, he says this, and we talked about it last week in Philippians 3. He says, this one thing I do. And he says things like that. He, he talks about kind of this singular focus. This ability to, to boil all things down to this, this essential this center in his mind and in his life and in his spirit. And I just want to encourage you as we come to this time at the Lord's table, one of the things that we are called to do in this moment is with everything going on, all the chaos, you know, land in planes and, and help with things take off without crashing all of them, we actually come and we're reminded in this moment of the thing that's at the middle in the center of it all, the center of our identity, the center of our activity. We come and we center our lives on Jesus. And we recognize that, that he is actually the one who came here and he centered his life on us and his death on us. And in the same way that this moment reminds us of his centering and his valuation of us as, as a treasure, we then also evaluate how we then value others and other things and what really is that that is a treasure. I think in this moment we have an opportunity to come in the midst of the chaos, even on a holiday weekend, and say, Jesus, I want you to be at the center of my thoughts, in the center of my life, in the center of my relationships, in the center of my soul. And so we come, and maybe Jesus, just like everyone else, but even more so, speaks into our world and into the chaos and into your life and says, will you remember as communion pass, is passed today, you'll receive two cups. One will be of bread and, and the other will be of juice. The bread will be underneath the juice. And we'll take those two cups and we will remember the death, burial, and resurrection and the promises that we have in Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, you're good. And we thank you for Jesus. And God, not only for him coming into our world, but for him abiding in us. So God, help us at this moment to remember, to center our thoughts and activities on him. Thank you. Thank you for the treasure that we have. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hello, and thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's word. Whether you're checking us out for the first time or coming back for our online weekly gathering, our hope is that you have an experience with Jesus that makes you long for more. The truth is, our lives were made for him, and we believe that we can experience the fullness of the life he offers by participating in the life of the church, which isn't a building to occupy or a screen to observe, but the community of people who call Jesus King. So we would love to invite you to come to our in-person gatherings, which we have Thursday at 645 and Sunday at 8, 915, and 1045. We know that not everyone's circumstances allow them to gather in person, but we do believe that experiencing Jesus can't be complete if it's only contained to an hour of an online service. 
and we want more than that for you. We want you to join a community of Jesus followers and consume the word of God, the bread and cup of the Lord's table, the encouragement found as many worship him, but to also to give, that you would be a blessing by singing, listening, sacrificing, participating, and being an encouragement to others who need your life and testimony to remind them of the greatness of our God. And if you have more questions about Christ Church, we're here for you. We'd love to connect and together experience completeness in Jesus. We'll see you soon. As then, as he realigns us to the things that matter most. Yesterday was my daughter's, my youngest daughter's 11th birthday. And it's really nothing for me as a father to, to give generously to her on her birthday to celebrate her. And we see this morning just the love of the father of what he has given. But we also have the opportunity to not only realign, but then also to give as well, to reflect the heart of the Father. From time to time, when we come to this time of generosity, we pray a prayer together, asking God to align us to that nature that he has, that nature of generosity, and that, that valuation of things, where we recognize who has more value rather than what has more value. So would you this morning join me in this prayer and pray it out loud with me as we pray this, this prayer together of generosity. Holy Father, there is nothing we have that you have not given us. All we have and all we are belong to you. To spend selfishly and to give without sacrifice is the way of the world. But generosity is the way of those who call Christ our Lord. So help us increase in generosity until it could be said that there is no needy person among us. Help us be trustworthy with such a little thing as money that you may trust us with true riches. Above all, help us to be generous because you, Father, are generous. May we show what you are like to all the world. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Well, you're being generous this morning. I'd love you for you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. And uh, we'll be using this chapter for our text this morning. If you're visiting Christ Church, my name's Mark, and uh, we're glad you're with us. I get to be one of the ministers here. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're glad you joined us. We're in the fourth week of a four-week series to the book of Philippians. And while uh, you're giving your generosity and opening your Bibles, just a couple of pieces of family business. Uh, if you look around, uh, it's a holiday weekend, and this service is pretty full. And uh, it's going to get more full in the next few weeks as students are going back to college and people are getting back in their fall routines and everything. And we want to encourage you with something we've been talking about for the last two or three weeks. Uh, we'd like to invite those of you who have flexibility on any particular Sunday uh, to join us on either Thursday night or our eight o'clock service, uh, which has preceded this one, obviously, this morning. And uh, uh, I've been joking, you can have plenty of parking in the parking lot. You could have your own row if you wanted it at 8 o'clock. Uh, there's a lot of space, and we know for those of you that don't have children and children's programming, but we also want to invite you, if you do have children, beginning next Sunday, we'll have an eight, at 8 o'clock, there'll be full children's programming at that hour, so that either if you come at 8, 9, 15, or 10, 45, there's a place for your children to have age-appropriate teaching in an environment with their peers. And so we want to encourage you. We're just looking for people uh, that could make 8 o'clock. If it's a sacrifice or not, we would consider it for you. If you would make a sacrifice and join us at 8 o'clock, even if you did it once a month, it would provide space in this service and next service for people to have a comfortable environment when they come visit us for the very first time. Also, I uh, want to encourage you. We have a Thursday night service. It's the first of our weekend. We have one on Thursday night and three on Sunday morning. And we're moving our 6.45 start time on Thursday nights beginning this Thursday to 6.30. So instead of 6.45, we'll meet at 6.30. And we'd like to encourage you, if you ever have a weekend where you're going to be traveling uh, for youth sports or you're going away for the weekend and taking a little mini vacation, we'd encourage you, if you want to join us, join us on Thursday night, be with the church family, see where we're going as a congregation, and we'd love for you to experience that if you've never done it. We meet over in Student Ministry East right across the little uh, grassy area out there. And uh, if you've never been on Thursday night, we'd love to have you come join us in that. Okay. Where have we been for the previous three weeks? We've been in chapters one, two, and three. And what we've learned is this letter Paul wrote to the people of Philippi was not a correction to poor doctrine or a correction to poor conduct. 
he actually writes a letter where he encourages us that there's joy. In chapter one, there's joy in the newness that the gospel brings to each one of us. Uh, we learned in week two that there's joy in surrendering to the God of the gospel and what he's doing in our lives. And in week three, we talked about there's, there's joy in the hope that comes from the essence of the gospel and what the Christianity actually means. Today, we're going to talk about the concept of peace and how Paul brings it all together beautifully in the fourth chapter about how we can find peace in what God is doing for us. Let's read verses 4 through 13. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and, pe and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Huh. The peace of God. It's an interesting concept. It's found throughout all of Scripture. There's three primary ways that the concept of peace is used in your Bible. The very first is <clears throat> the peace that comes from salvation. Having been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ through the work of God through the beginning, from the beginning of time forward, there's a peace that comes at knowing we're right with God. If you'd like to write this down, if you're a note taker, Romans 5 would be a chapter you might look at to understand how the peace of God comes through salvation. Another way that peace is used in Scripture is the peace that will come to earth when Jesus comes back as triumphant king. And you might read Isaiah chapter 2 would be a chapter that would indicate what the Bible says about that moment. So there's the peace that comes with salvation. There's the peace that comes at Jesus' return. And the peace we're talking about today that's found in Philippians 4 and in John 14 is the peace that comes from grasping onto God in all things, making God the priority of why and how you do everything you do. So that's how peace is used. It's often called shalom. That's the Hebrew word for it. I like this practical working definition of shalom. It's when you're right with God, salvation. You're right with one another in unity. And you're right within your own soul. You have confessed and come to understand who you are in Christ. When you have a, a peace with God, peace with one another, and peace within yourself, you have wholeness. Shalom. You're complete. You're a fully engaged, healed person. So when we talk about peace, uh, there's some practical definitions of it as well. It's this inner calm and equilibrium. It's this concept of that it's a tranquil state of the soul because you're whole. And in fact, look at verse 11 and 12. Paul did something interesting here. He says, I have learned how to be content in whatever circumstance. In verse 12, I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. Now, you might focus on the word content, and that wouldn't be a bad thing. I actually want to focus on another word that he uses twice here. Whenever there's uh, this reproducing this concept or repeating something, he repeats the word learned. I think Paul's helpful here. This peace of God is not natural to us because we're broken in sin and we live in a broken world. This is not something that we're just naturally born with, but this peace is something we can learn. It's experienced, and when it's experienced, it grows. So peace is this inner calm. It's also, peace is not merely an absence of something, it's a greater presence. So, so peace is not just the absence of fear or negative thoughts or threats. The peace that we're talking about is a sense of safety and protection no matter what. So it's not the lack of things in our life that brings us peace, it's the presence of something greater. So if, if you do the little equation I just gave you, it would sound more like this. You can be living in terrible moments and have peace if you have God. But if you have peace only because your circumstances are cool, you won't have sustaining peace. It's temporary if it exists at all. So Paul tells us that this thing that God wants to bring our lives is peace when we don't have peace. It's calm when we should be frantic. It's to feel safe when we're surrounded by threats. 
This is the kind of peace. And, and where do we find this? Verse 4. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. So here's the freeing moment. This is where the gospel frees us today. The peace is not brought about by you. It's only brought about by his presence. It's when we are in Christ and we have God in our lives and we're engaging him because he's always engaging us. But when we're engaging him, then we have the peace that's found that we can rejoice in the Lord always. And then Paul says, and I'll tell you again, rejoice in him. So it's not rejoicing in my strength or my power or my intellect or my ability to reason through all of this. No, it's something completely different. And then look at verse 9. The God of peace will be with you. The God who brings peace, the God who is our peace, his presence is what brings it to us. If you look in our life stories, if you go to all the great literature, especially Christian literature, if you take the classic like the Lord of the Rings and, and the Chronicles of Narnia or the Wingfeather Saga, you have these great moments where the hero gets into a predicament that he's not big enough or she's not big enough to overcome and they get defeated and in most cases they die, but they're not dead. The story, even though on the human level, was done. The movement of what God is doing in the world brings them back from death to life, whether it's figurative or literal. And there's a reason that story resounds in us, because this is what Paul says brings us peace. Even in the face of death, because I am in the Lord and the Lord is in me, there is not even death will keep me down. My, my worst six months of my life is not bigger than God. So I have this tranquil state of knowing that my God is bigger than anything I face. Having said all of that, if this peace is not natural and it's given to us by God, then how do we go about receiving it? So what are the disciplines by which you can learn, develop, or train for peace? This is why I think the brilliance of the fourth chapter of Philippians is so significant. So Paul gives me, I found three things in here that I want to share with you this morning to encourage your heart. The first is, if you want peace in your life, a peace that sustains even in the worst moments, pay attention to how we think. It's where we start. It's where Paul starts. Focus on what your mind is focused on and see what happens. Verses 8 and 9. Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, now look down at the end of the verse, Think about such things. And verse 9, and the God of peace will be with you. This is Paul's promise to us, that what you think about. Now, we're not talking about the loftiness of mind. The world will say, just think incredibly deep thoughts. No, it's, not, it's, it's more than that. And it's not actually the opposite, which we're taught too regularly, which is to empty your mind. You know, to sit in a certain position and moan for 20 minutes and empty yourself. The world offers us that as meditation, and there's nothing wrong with meditating except if you're not meditating on anything significant. Then it's just wasted motion. So what are we talking about here? I believe Paul's talking about when he says what is true, noble, right, and pure. He's talking about the teachings of Scripture. He's talking about the deep truths of the gospel all the way back to surrendering and all the way back to chapter 1 when we talked about what it is to be new and to have new hope and new life and all the newness that the gospel brings. We're talking about these things. Who is God? Does he love me? How would I know? Why did Jesus come and what did he do? And what difference does it make? And if he truly came and all of these things are true, then how might I live my life and what should I live for? You see, the, what we think about does shape where we go and what we become. So Paul's saying, think about these things. In fact, he uses a word to describe how we're to think. And it's actually an accounting term. It means to reckon. If I can put it in the vernacular we use today, what is Paul is saying when he says, think about these things, he's saying, do the math. If God is who the scriptures teach him to be and the evidence of my life has indicated, then how then does that change my reality? And when people become hopeless, it's because they're basing their hope on their ability to sustain riches or fame or relationships or health. And we can't, right? Every one of us realizes we are not running this thing. We're being run by it. But when we place our hope in God, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say find joy. 
Find joy in him by doing the math, training your mind to preach the gospel. Okay, if you're new here to Christ Church, uh, I often warn the church I'm going to have a mini rant here. All right, be warned. Thursday night we were having service. In, when I was going through my notes, I thought there's a hymn from my past that we sang in church growing up, and it's a powerful because I use the expression here, preach the gospel to yourself. And some of you might say, well, what does that actually mean? It means tell yourself the story. And then I remember a hymn from my growing up in the church. You know, I was the first, honestly, first Sunday I was alive, I was in the nursery, right? Because my mom had to work. So we went to church. My mom went to junior church, put me in the nursery, and there I've been ever since. And I have no regrets. I love my heritage. But some of the music we sang in the church growing up stuck to my mind. So I went to all of these kids in our worship teams. They're children. Some of them are even potty trained. I'm telling you right now. I went to them Thursday night and I said, hey, there's a hymn you might sing when I'm done. It was kind of late notice. I said, if you can't fit it in, I understand. It just popped in my head. But the, I said, do you know the hymn? I love to tell the story. Blank expressions. I said, you've never even heard it. And then one of them said, well, sing it to me and I'll know it. If I sing it, you still wouldn't know it because I'm horrible. <laughs> but I said, you don't know the song? And this one girl looks at me and she goes, I was born in 2001. <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's past your bedtime, honey. You need to go home. <laughs> like, that's an excuse. And I said to her, who's the president in 1980? Ronald Reagan. I said, huh, you can learn history. Anyway, and we moved on. <laughs> but in this moment, I'm like, oh. Because I don't know about you, but when I want to remind myself of what matters, I find songs do it for me. Scriptures do it too. But I think of a song of our past. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it's true. It satisfies my longings like nothing else can do. That's what it means to preach the gospel to your heart. It's to tell yourself the, the truths and to celebrate those truths. Our whole theme in this book of Philippians is if we're going to rejoice, there's reasons we celebrate and we can celebrate the truth because Christian peace does not come from emptying your mind. It comes from filling it with things that cannot be taken from you, things that cannot be diminished by circumstances or finances or relationships. If Jesus is on the throne ruling everything for you, that is either your hope or this is as good as it gets. And I don't know about you, but if this is as good as it gets, check please, I'm done. Because it's not getting better. It's getting harder and more difficult. Then I remember what Dr. Timothy Keller says in one of, my, one of the most powerful illustrations he's ever used, and it just sticks in my mind. He says, if you've ever been on the, on the beach or on the coast, and the, the rocks are lining the beach and the waves come ferociously in and they attack the shore. And he said, they're powerful. And if you go out in the water and you try to stand against them, they will take your meaninglessness and they will take you for a throw. And you'll end up underwater, upside down, right? We've all been there. As little kids, we thought we'd fight the waves and we lost. And he says, you see the waves coming against the rocks and you see the, the waves come in and crash with great power and noise and they surround the rocks. And he says, and deep in our hearts, we may wonder, did the rock move or did the rock chip? Did the influence of the waves, which overwhelmed the stone, did it change its at all because of its power? And he says, then you see the waves reside and the rock has not moved and the rock is not changed. And what I loved about his illustration was, he says, but don't be mistaken. You and I are not the rock. He's the rock. And if we hide ourselves in the cleft of the rock, we will stand against anything. But left to ourselves, we will get wiped out. I thought that was so powerful. That's what I'm telling you today when I say, think about such things. That Jesus is the only safe place. He's the only hope. He's my only strength. How about yours? So if you want the peace of God to be able to rejoice in the Lord, think about how you think. Secondly, Look at how you express your gratitude from peace. It, it becomes real when we actually can celebrate that Jesus is the rock. He is our hope. In fact, uh, I learned this a couple summers ago. My friend Jason French was leading a week of Christ and Youth in Holland, Michigan, and I was there with him. And he said, hey, would you do our little devotion Sunday morning for the staff? And I said, 100%. And I was in Philippians at the time, and I read verse 6. This is what it says. Don't be anxious, but make requests to God with thanksgiving. 
And so I pulled up my, my little Bible software and I started to do some playing with the words to see if there was something significant. And I saw something I'd never seen before. And this is what Paul says. He says, go with thanksgiving as you pray. Go with gratitude that whatever God says in response will be good with you. I'd never seen that before. I always thought I would be happy if God did what I asked him to do. Anybody else interpret it that way? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll thank God when he gives me what I want. And Paul's actually saying the opposite. No, go with gratitude knowing that God, if God even said no, you would be pleased with that because you know him. You trust him. Now, this is not manipulating God. This is not going and saying, Mom, you're the best mom ever, the best mom in the entire world. Could I have $5? This is not playing God for the fool. It's actually going in with the heart of gratitude that says, because I think about these things and I know who God is and I know what he's done and I know he loves me and I know he's forgiven me, that I can trust him because the gospel settles our minds so we can rest in prayer rather than fight in prayer or argue in prayer. Now, I don't know this. I can't pull up a scripture to do this, but I think human nature is undefeated. So I assume this. Do you think Paul ever prayed for God to free him? I, I imagine if I'm Paul and I'm in prison, and all, the only reason I'm in prison is I'm bold enough to say Jesus Christ is Lord and Caesar isn't. Do you think for a minute that Paul might have said to God, you know, God, let's, let's look at it this way. If you let me out, I can raise up five more Timothys and Tituses and Barnabases, and I can plant 50 more churches, and I could preach for the next 50 years the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world. I could help you get this work done, and I think, God, that would be good, right? And God would be like, that would be good, except no. Your testimony is going to resound for thousands of years because you were willing to stay where I had you and you would become beheaded, history might record, for the sake of the gospel and your story. I need you to do this for me because I'm going to do something with it. That man would tell you and I, don't be anxious about anything, but in all things with thanksgiving, make your request known. Pretty powerful testimony. God is calling you and I to trust the sovereign will of God in all things. This is why in Romans 8, it says that God, that God works together all things for good to those who called according to his purpose. Which means that ultimately God will overrule all the evil. God will overrule all the death. God will overrule all of our anxieties, the things that bring us anxieties. God is going to do all of that, and he may not do it before we die. But like all the great stories, death is not the end of us. God will overrule even that. So, let's say you met Elon Musk, okay? According to what I read, he's got a couple of bucks. Guy's doing all right, right? He's making spacecrafts for fun. He's got some money. And you met Elon Musk, and he heard your story, and he wanted to bless you. He just wanted to be kind to you, and he wrote you a check for $100,000, would you go to the bank with any nervousness or would you pretty much assume as soon as you cash that check, I don't know about you, but as soon as he handed it to me, I'd be heading to the bank. And when I went to the bank, I would be horrified and shocked beyond my imagination if that check bounced. You see what I'm talking about here? Okay, let me rephrase it. If I gave you a check for $100,000, you probably wouldn't even go to the bank. And I would hand it to you because I'm kind but foolish because there's n it's not going to cash. It's going to bounce 78 times because I don't have it to give to you. What I'm trying to tell you is Paul's encouraging you and I, because we preach the gospel to ourselves and we actually go to him fully expecting that the goodness of God is ours, that even when he says no, in other words, I know it's corny, but I'm a corny preacher. Can you take God to the bank? Can you live your life trusting that whatever he says he'll do, he's going to do? And you have no doubt at all he's able to deliver on every promise, every check he's ever written you. You see, this is what we're being encouraged to do. To focus on how we think. To express gratitude with every request because we trust him. And lastly, if you want the peace of Christ in your life, look at how you reorder your love. That's what he tells us to do. How do we reorder our love. We've reordered our minds, 
but there's a peace. In fact, some of you paying attention, I hope you still have your Bibles open. Look at verse 8 with me because you'll notice I cherry-picked that verse. I didn't read the whole thing. I picked the parts I wanted to talk about. Let's reread verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, pause, those are all things that have to do with the mind and the will. But he goes on. Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You see, he told us to think about the great truths of the gospel, but then he also tells us to focus our minds on the beautiful things of the gospel, to enjoy all that comes with these truths, all those things that are lovely and praiseworthy and excellent, the work that God's doing. If I can rephrase it, Paul is urging us not just to reorder our thoughts of our minds, but to engage the affections of our heart. To choose to love the things that God is doing more than the other things that we have in life. It's not just enough to think the right things. It's also as important to love the right things. See how brilliant he is here, led by the Holy Spirit? Because I don't believe we will change our hearts if we don't change our minds. But I also then believe that when we change our minds to the value of the gospel, we will begin to love the things of God in a level we've never loved them before, and that will bring us what? Peace. We won't be drinking the poison of the world and wondering why we're sick. We'll be drinking from the well of life that never runs dry, that brings hope and joy to us. If you would read the rest of the chapter, which we're not going to cover this morning because it's really simple. If you read it, you're going to see Paul uses the word content several times in this chapter, how he's learned to be content and how he's trusting in God in all things. And that means to be independent of circumstances. That's what contentment means. I'm able to live above my, my current circumstances to realize I'm fine and I will be fine. And this is the hope and peace that comes from the gospel. You see, I've always loved this about God in the practical way. God doesn't say to me, Mark, don't care about your career. Don't care about your lawn. Don't care about the upkeep of your home. He he doesn't say to me, Mark, stop caring about your kids' ball games. You know, he could have really drilled me last night. Mark, it's just Notre Dame football. It is not. But anyway, I, I, I digress. God says, I want you to enjoy the things of this earth, but don't make them supreme. You see, the issue is not that we love our families too much or our possessions too much or our careers too much. The issue may be we don't love God enough because we understand the beauty of God having preached the gospel to ourselves and coming to him with trust. All of a sudden we realize who he is and then we love God above all things and Jesus would say everything else will be added. Don't worry about that. So we not only celebrate the truth and we celebrate our hope, but Paul tells us to celebrate the faithfulness of God, which means we have to relocate the glory we give things and reallocate our love to better things. I've tried to figure out how to explain this, and then I heard a story. Let's talk about the secret of peace. I heard a story that I thought was fascinating. A young man became a believer. He realized his sin. He, it had devastated his life. He turned to God. He found Jesus. He found the truth of the gospel, and he became a believer. And he decided what he wanted to do is he took a piece of paper, and he wrote on one side all the things he was going to do for God to show his gratitude. And then he wrote on the other side the things he would no longer do for the same reason. And he went into his church. He got in the church in the middle of the day. He walked up on the altar. He laid his piece of paper on the altar. And he said as he was walking out of the church, uh, he became very sad. It's like, that's not enough. So he went back home. He took another piece of paper. And he wrote down on the left side all the things he would additionally do for God and all the things he would additionally never do again to honor God. And he walked back to the altar of the church and he laid that piece of paper on top of the other piece of paper. And he said as he turned to walk away, he became very, very sad. So he thought, I need to go talk to my pastor. He described his pastor as a wise man. I think he said something like, he's bald, has green eyes, very handsome, something like that. But anyway, when he walked Oh, to his pastor's office, he explained what happened. And his pastor looked at him with a smile. He said, just take a sheet of paper, write your name at the bottom, and go put it on the altar. See what he did? He said, when you know who God is, you don't have to tell him what you will or won't do. Just open yourself up to his presence. And they said he walked away with what? Peace. He said, I can trust him. Whatever he'd ask me to do, I can trust I can do it because he'll, he'll empower me. And I can trust that I can do it because it's good. 
and I trust his character, and I know that even if I should face death for the sake of the gospel, there's life. This is why verse 7 is so clear. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you notice that? What we think about and what we love and how we love, the peace of Christ is what brings that together. And should we take our lives as a blank piece of paper and simply sign our name at the bottom, yours? What does it do? It teaches us to trust God the way Jesus trusted God. If you look at the story of Jesus as you tell yourself the gospel, you're going to realize he had 100% proof and evidence that he trusted God. And he even thanked God in advance the night he was betrayed. Read John 14 through John 17 and Listen to the heart of a man thanking God for what he's about to get to do and then read the rest of John and see what he did. And Jesus is our demonstration. If you take that life as a piece of paper and you sign your name, it'll bring you victory. It'll bring you beauty. It'll bring you healing. And it will bring you joy in the Lord. And it will end up in peace. In John 14, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. We don't manufacture it. We learn it by emptying our hearts and minds of things we should not love as much as we do or thoughts we should not hold as valuable. And we fill our minds with the truth of the gospel, the presence of Jesus, the gratitude for his sacrifice, and we live our lives to simply become the kind of people who would give him anything. And it will bring us peace. For some of you here this morning, You may not have a relationship with Jesus. We're glad you're here. There's no judgment on that. We've all been where you were. But if you would ask the people around you, they would tell you, we don't want to go back to living. His lordship is a gift. It brings peace and hope and life. So maybe you need to begin the conversation of handing him that piece of paper saying, I trust who you are, but I don't know what it's going to bring. I don't know the circumstances. And the peace of Christ will guide your hearts and minds. He'll guard it. Or maybe you're like me and you've been on the journey of being a disciple, but you realize you're filling your mind with all the concerns of life and all your responsibilities and all the things you have to control. And maybe today's the day we surrender our minds back to. He is sovereign God. He knows what he's talking about and I trust him. Maybe for the first time in our lives, we take that blank piece of paper and we set it before him. We say, I'm yours and I trust you. The back of the room are tables with lamps on them. People are going to be heading in that direction to meet you back there. If you need to be prayed with this morning or encouraged, maybe you have a question that's been on your heart and mind. We'd love to help connect you with a pastor or a counselor or or give you some materials to help you develop your heart, mind, and soul to follow Jesus. But the good news of the gospel this morning for me is I get to tell you and I get to receive what I tell you. The peace of Christ is available to all of us in Jesus if we'll turn to him. Let's stand together.
Let's continue to lift our voices this morning, singing to a God who has given his promise, who is just. We wait for you. Justice, your mercy, revival in our city. We wait for you, Lord. Christ, our King, be enthroned, be lifted high. Christ, our Forever glorify. We wait for you, Lord. We wait for you, Lord. The healing is broken, the building, the ruins. We wait for you. As our Philippians sermon series comes to a close this morning, I just want to read a passage of scripture over us on our way out. And in Philippians, we've been learning that Paul has been teaching the church of Philippi to do certain things. And he's been saying, do these things that I'm teaching you. Go out and do these things. Um, And just as he's urging the church in Philippi to do those things, he's also encouraging us in that way. So I just want to read this passage over us. Finally, 
Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. This is Philippians 4, 8 through 9. You are dismissed.